Hello. Um, again, I'm Alexandra Skaggs with Barron's, uh, and I'm here with Jack Zen, uh, CEO and co-founder of AirWallX. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Um, so I, I have to say I did a little bit of research before this, and uh, you guys have a really interesting founding story. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you guys came up with, with the idea for AirWallX and sort of um, you know, where that came from? Um, we started the business about four years ago to solving some of the cost control um, and speed uh, efficiency issues in B2B cross-border payment. And the story is quite simple. So we um, invested in a retail business in Australia that require a lot of um, importing from Southeast Asia and China um, that the only solution available was uh, the banks and Western Union at the time. Um, it's extremely difficult to moving money um, efficiently um, to, in, you know, to those capital control the country uh, in Asia Pacific. And if you look at Asia Pacific market, most of the markets uh, are super regulated and capital controlled, which means there's very few um, liquidity providers out there can provide electronic liquidity uh, for the currency conversion. Also, the compliance is you know, pretty much paper-based. Um, Using the example of making payment to China uh, back then, uh, we had to pay close to 4% on the currency conversion. To make a payment to the supplier based out of Shenzhen, which is uh, one of the, you know, the most sort of developed cities in uh, southern China, uh, these companies would generally open a bank account in Hong Kong, um, and we have to pay them in Hong Kong. They try to figure out how to move in the money back to China, which is the overall process could take you know, longer than a week, and the actual loss in the uh, currency conversion could um, be over 4%. Wow, so that's 4% and a week of time to move money just between Hong Kong and China. Yeah, basically any overseas uh, markets in, in China mm -hmm. for the B2B payment. Um, and so then you guys founded your company, um, and it's really interesting hearing about what you do because um, you guys sort of take bank infrastructure and then put your own technology on top of it, right, and sort of facilitate payments that way. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about what the company does and, and how that saves time and money? Um, I guess um, uh, the uh, majority of the cross-border payment is uh, still powered by the traditional correspondent banking network, which is SWIFT. Um, there's very limited information that you can pass in uh, together through uh, the money flow uh, using the SWIFT messages, uh, which make the actual um, payment uh, into those capital control countries is extremely difficult because all the compliance have to be paper-based. Mm. Um, and uh, what we've been doing is really um, build um, integrations with more than 50 banks uh, in Asia Pacific and also around the world um, to build API layer sitting on top allowed us to programmatically pull and push payments through these local banking partners. Um, because we have developed each of the integration um, ourselves and we interconnect them into a global sort of singular network, uh, at which, you know, you know, over 90% of our transaction, we can actually bypass the correspondent banking SWIFT network. Mm -hmm. uh, so from a speed and efficiency and cost perspective that literally we can, um, you know, save 90%. Also, for most of the countries that uh, we are working with, we can do the same day payment. Uh, now we have um, basically can, um, using our domestic infrastructure to process um, international payments uh, in over 100 countries. So who are your main customers? Um, we, we're working with some of the um, uh, fast growing, uh, I guess, internet companies. Mm -hmm. um, I guess the, um, the rise of, um, you know, internet in the last sort of 20 years really changed the way um, people do business. Um, and as well as the rise of marketplaces in the last uh, decade really changed the way people doing global businesses. You know, traditionally when people talk about global business, you think about Walmart, um, those, you know, Google, those large uh, internet company or traditional businesses, but now, 
uh, with the rise of marketplaces like Uber, Airbnb, Amazon, eBay, uh, you could um, you know, be a two people uh, business and selling stuff uh, on those marketplaces or providing a service on Airbnb, uh, you essentially become a global business. Um, and that really changed the way people think about uh, globalization and the digital economy. Uh, Air Wallet's vision is to become the AWS of global banking and core payments to helping businesses at all size to scale uh, in international scale. And so I know that we were talking about this a little bit before in the green room, but um, people tend to get you guys mixed up with a remittances company, right? But you guys don't really do the customer to customer you know, transfer payments, it's more business focused, uh, sort of providing cloud software for that stuff, right? Yes, I guess, um, you know, there's a um, lot of people ask, you know, what's the difference between you guys and TransferWise, Interam, um, Remitly, and those sort of P2P or consumer facing uh, remittance businesses that we don't deal with um, consumer directly ourselves. Um, so we, we kind of different from the digital banks and transfer sort of businesses. Uh, but just say um, if someone that want to run a startup to uh, build a consumer application like TransferWise, they can build it very, very fast by leveraging our infrastructure globally. Uh, so we allowed uh, startups and, and fintechs and also uh, internet companies to innovating, leveraging uh, the programmatic interface we have built uh, with so many um, banks and financial institutions worldwide. Uh, and so where are you guys doing most of your business right now? Uh, we, as, you know, we started from Australia, uh, which is our home country. Then we quickly expanded to China and Southeast Asia. Um, um, the, the business is growing very, very, very fast in the uh, last 18 months, uh, and our revenue and processing volume have been growing over 30% month on month. Now we're processing you know, billions of dollars um, on, on a monthly basis. Uh, we um, just launched our business in UK and Europe um, in um, last month, uh, so that was uh, in the trial stage at the, at the moment. Uh, and we hope we can get some significant traction um, later this year. Uh, we also launched in Southeast Asia, uh, in some of the countries. Uh, we are planning to launch in the United States um, in Q4 and Q Q1 uh, next year. And how is it working with all of those different regulatory regimes? Uh, it's, it's super complicated, it's especially um, in, in within Asia Pacific, um, mm -hmm. because those, um, you know, it, it took time just to explain to the, the local regulator uh, in Asia what is the API, you know, what is the programmatic interface, um, and how you can do uh, street through processing for payment without based on and, and rely on the, the paper-based compliance documentation, which is, they have been relying on that for the last 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. uh, and also demonstrating to the regulator uh, the type of payment flow you are you are doing and why is uh, a, a lot lower risk um, in, in the financial ecosystem and how you control the money laundering, uh, the fraud um, that, that flowing into those um, uh, systems. They, they also quite uh, concerned about money escaping those countries uh, and how are you demonstrating the ability uh, to uh, the regulator that you can um, helping them to providing transparency um, of data to the regulator rather than um, kind of making the system um, deficiency. Okay, so um, you guys sort of work with regulators and provide them data to sort of um, calm those fears then. Um, and, and in Europe, I mean, I'm assuming that it's a little bit different there. Uh, is the regulatory regime in Europe different? Um, I think every, um, every regulator is different. Um, uh, now our payment rails cover uh, the entire Asia Pacific apart from Taiwan. And that's using the country we haven't solved, which is Taiwan example. Um, you know, we've been working with the Taiwan regulator for the last four years, uh, but there's no single provider can uh, provide TWD, which is a domestic currency clearing uh, in Taiwan. Uh, so for example, if you're a host of Airbnb uh, and Airbnb wanted to making a Taiwan dollar payment to the host by providing the services, which is very, very popular in Taiwan. 
Um, and uh, there's no single provider in the world can help them to do that. So that post can only get paid in, in US dollar. Mm. Uh, and we try to uh, basically go into the regulator um, to explain the necessity of this type of payment to be electronic uh, and, and speedy. Because um, you know, right now the host have to open a domestic bank account, physically walking into the branch mm. and changing US dollar to Taiwanese dollar. Um, on a sort of weekly basis, which is insane, right? I mean, if you look at the G10 currency, everything is freely traded. There's no capital control, and it seems, uh, you know, rather easy to deal with. But, you know, there's 90% of the country in, in Asia is not in that bucket and require a lot of um, proprietary solution to, to solve those problems. And I know that, you know, as you guys look at the U.S., you know, you have a also complex regulatory regime here, it sounds like. Um, are you working with states or, or how is the sort of, um, you know, opening, the, the process of opening in the U.S.? Um, you know, I mean, we're, we're getting a license in the U.S. is like getting a license in 50 different countries. Um, so we, we have to go through the MTL application in every single state. Um, but the good thing is they are, um, companies have done this and there are um, consultancies and, and law firms who have um, done that in the past. So you're just really um, developing a standard um, um, that meeting the local regulatory requirements. So it's, relati it's relatively straightforward actually mm -hmm. uh, compared to some of the uh, countries that have no guidelines or, or laws or regulations that are very, very clearly describing that Pacific business model or some of the countries in APAC going through uh, an involvement of the local regulation. So, you know, traditionally those businesses could be not regulated, but now it's, it's regulated. And the how it's been regulated was, was not clearly defined and could be even more trickier. Right. And I, I think that, um, you know, that sort of highlights the interesting role that you guys have uh, within these markets because you're, on one hand, you're a disruptor, but on the other hand, you're working with the existing infrastructure and partnering with banks. Um, can you talk a little bit about where you guys see yourselves in com compared to traditional banks? Uh, we, we definitely uh, see ourselves uh, are not disrupting. We, uh, we're not reinventing the, the infrastructure domestically. Uh, mm -hmm. We're not re reinventing Wales, basically. So we, every single country, uh, instead of, you know, for example, like a traditional global bank city, you know, um, instead of they build a branch themselves, uh, getting a banking license themselves, uh, we're just leveraging some of the largest and more digital friendly banks in that domestic market, build this technology layer, allow um, you know, them to moving that offline payments and banking capability to online in that market, uh, interconnecting into a global service cloud uh, to providing a true sort of banking and service in a global scale. Um, and uh, we can, um, you know, attracting businesses um, that's basically servicing consumers or businesses in many, many countries uh, that don't want to work with um, 20, 30 different financial institutions and regulators worldwide. I mean, who, who wants to do that? And we can basically be the single interface facing those global companies and then helping them to uh, grow and scaling uh, in every corner of the world. And you guys do a lot more than just payments, right? You're um, expanding your business, I guess, to provide different services. Um, I mean, where, where do you guys see yourselves going next? Um, we, we launched a lot of product in the last four years. We launched a, um, a, a global account product, which is through a, a single KYC. We allowed our customers uh, to open a bank account in um, 14 different currencies and, and more than 50 countries uh, electronically. Uh, real time, basically, uh, to receiving uh, online and offline payment, also uh, pay out uh, online and offline payments. Uh, we, because everything we do is in a global scale, so we have developed a very sophisticated foreign exchange trading engine that directly participating in the interbank market, so that uh, we have a product we launched, we called LockFX, allowed our customer to lock the foreign exchange rate at uh, any time interval, you know, one minute or 15 minutes or 24 hour or a week um, without uh, currency holidays, uh, without banking holidays, those sort of all weekends and we can providing uh, FX guarantee at any uh, basically 365 days and 24 by seven. 
Uh, and by working with the local domestic player, financial institution allowed us to push payment, basically sending money to more than 100 countries using the local infrastructure. Uh, and we're in the process of launching uh, our issuing API, which is you know, more, more than pr programmatic card issuing um, um, uh, in uh, some of the Asian market and, and Europe. Uh, and we're looking at to really scale that uh, later next year. Uh, we're also looking into uh, getting into the acquiring business, which is online payments processing from the consumers for the, uh, our existing customers. And some of the, the businesses that you're talking about involve credit provision, right? Um, and so, I mean, do you guys think that um, your position and, and the sort of data that you have allows you to um, be in, a, in an interesting spot for that? Yeah, then let's use uh, a seller selling on Amazon example. Traditionally, uh, when you're making payment, you don't know anything about the information, what the seller's been selling uh, and where it's been selling it, who is the logistic provider. But with us, that we can get the actual public key that connect to the Amazon, we can pull those data uh, electronically. So we have all the data of what the consumer has purchased from this seller, um, you know, how long the logistics will take, which company it is, and what, uh, how much it costs. Uh, and with all those data that we can provide in invoice financing, uh, we can provide in uh, cash management or revolving loans, so everything become a data-driven uh, closed-loop ecosystem. Well, it's really fascinating stuff. Um, and I do think that's all the time that we have, pretty much. Um, but thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Alex. Thanks. Please welcome to the stage from CB Insights, Matthew Wong. All right, how's everyone doing today? Day two. Hopefully we'll have better luck with the weather a little later with the rain uh, stops. But uh, I just want to piggyback off what uh, Jack at Air Wallex was talking about, and we're going to have uh, SG Lee from TOS, which is a very exciting company out of Korea, which is, uh, has started with P2B payments and expanding into other financial services verticals. But what I want to do uh, today in the next few minutes is just walk through sort of what is a playbook? Is there a playbook evolving for how internet giants in Asia are sort of building um, and creating super apps uh, within fintech? So starting maybe with one product and expanding all the way through into maybe starting with payments into wealth management, insurance, lending, and other areas. So if you look at a company today like Ant Financial, today Ant Financial is about 150 billion as of its latest valuation. If you compare that to some of the largest banks in the world as of their latest market caps, it would rank among the top 10 in terms, of, uh, in terms of where their value stands. Of course, I think a lot of people think of Ant Financial as a financial company, and I think that may be sort of the wrong way to be thinking about it. If we look actually on the other side of the table, even looking at just tech companies, Ant would also rank among one of the top 10 largest tech companies in the world. So if, if, no matter which way you swing it, I think there's obviously Ant is a, is a major force to be reckoned with. You heard from my colleague, uh, REA, uh, who talked a little bit about what some of the other tech giants are doing uh, within financial services. But of course, a lot of them are sort of single line going after payments and some other areas as well. But if you look at companies in China like Ant and Tencent, they've really built out this entire ecosystem of financial products on their platforms that they're offering to consumers. So we're gonna talk a little bit about how did they do that? What was sort of the playbook to building that out? And how are they successfully sort of evolving for the future? So what does this playbook look like? I'm gonna go through sort of step by step, but if we think about it sort of at a high level, uh, originally it was really just to leverage the existing user base um, of, of platform users to expand into mobile wallets. Um, as they did that and gathered more data based on transactions, uh, a lot of features that were built out were g g aimed at locking in users by providing access to new uh, features like money management as well as uh, microloans. But now as we think more about where they're headed now, it's, it's really about building higher margin profiles through marketplaces that they're building out, and then also augmenting that with additional levers for engagement, so keeping people really using the apps and then cycling back into adding more users and thus more, uh, more users who are adding more financial products on their platform. So let's talk with, about payments a little bit. Um, if we look at you know, China today, Alipay and WeChat Pay certainly are the two leading uh, companies within uh, China's sort of emerging cashless economy. And there's, you know, there's many reasons for why this happened. Uh, could talk about some of them, but largely, you know, if you think about Ant Financial as well as WeChat Pay, one was sort of the emergence of new, new features like peer-to-peer -peer payments, the sort of 
red envelope feature for Tencent, uh, probably the most popular, which has enabled a lot of people to exchange money to each other on Chinese New Year and, and other, also other occasions as well, as well as the transition to mobile e-commerce. So in about 2011, I think 15% of Alibaba's uh, total transaction volume was, was on mobile. Uh, last year, it was about 85%. So certainly everyone is now buying the, uh, everything they do on their phones, and that certainly helped propel uh, Alipay as well. So payment certainly was the, the first uh, part of this sort of flywheel and, and playbook. What have been some of the features they've added since? Uh, certainly in, in the case of Ant Financial, I think Yuibao was probably one of the most important features that they, they've built. And this was sort of on the back of realizing that a lot of their users were, had a lot of idle cash sitting in their virtual wallets, providing a, a, a way for them to invest that cash into money market funds, which uh, has emerged as the largest money market fund in the world, has, has become a little smaller um, since then, and we'll talk a little bit as to reasons why. Um, but if you look at just the number of investors who are now on the Yui Bao platform, uh, it's about one third of China's entire population. So uh, pretty amazing stat if you just take a step back and think about that. Another area in which Ant has built out sort of a feature to lock in users and, and keep them engaged is in lending. They have three different lending products, both for SMBs as well as consumers. And a big part of this is just using that transaction data that they're gathering through the payments features um, and being able to do this well. So they've distributed about $13 billion in, in microloans to small businesses and, and also providing you know, small loans to consumers as well. So another aspect of this idea of locking in users. But now as we think about where Ant is headed, it's really becoming less of a financial services provider and more as a platform and building out a marketplace for other financial institutions to, um, to sort of take place as well. So I think the big idea here is to think about Ant Financial as a um, platform for allowing uh, other financial institutions to uh, take advantage of their access to distribution as well as data. So today, I think the big, the big thing here is that about 100 million users or over 100 million users are using all five of these functions that Ant has built out, whether that's wealth management, whether that's insurance, whether that's lending, as well as payments. Um, and I think that's really important. I think that's going to build the business into a much more higher margin business as they think about building this into more of a marketplace and surfacing these products for their consumers. Um, if we think about wealth management, for example, and maybe why we've seen some of a reduction in Yui Bao's sort of money market funds, they're now offering uh, 116 mutual fund asset management companies on their product called Ant Fortune. This is a marketplace for uh, wealth type products, have 180 million users. And again, it's all about driving margins by distributing, uh, distributing products from other financial services companies um, on, this, on this feature. And so how are they, how are you know, companies like Ant also keeping users engaged and coming back and, and building more of this profile in which they're also um, going back and, and buying more financial products? Um, one is by adding additional levers of engagement. If you think about an app like WeChat Pay, certainly you're using the app every day multiple times. But Ant Financial, you may not necessarily be doing that. So having to continue to innovate to, to bring in users and, and engage with them. One of the features that's become extremely popular over the last year is this feature called uh, Xian Hubao, which is a, basically a crowdfunding platform for users to, um, if one, one person becomes critical ill, cri uh, has a, falls critically ill, they'll be able to crowdfund payments for that. It's, it's not necessarily an insurance platform, but um, certainly have reached uh, users, almost actually 50 million users in less of the time than Yui Bao took uh, to reach 43 million users when they launched the Money Market Fund. So a very popular product, especially among rural, uh, China's rural population, um, and given sort of the state of uh, medical uh, in, in China as well. So where's the playbook going next? We're seeing this, I think, this same flywheel take place in, in other regions of the world. I'll go through just a few examples. Um, next, one is in India. We're seeing companies like Paytm also look to build out uh, a model around starting as a mobile wallet and also emerging into other financial services, uh, adding features such as Paytm Gold, for example, now building out a mutual fund investment platform called Paytm Money. And now, uh, most recently, uh, as you heard from Citi yesterday, launching a credit card uh, with Citibank and uh, features like unlimited 1% cashback. So similar type of playbook in which you're seeing that start with mobile payments, bringing a lot of data in, locking in users, and, and now expanding into other areas where they can um, build higher margins by offering you know, brokerage as well as investment products to their users. In Latin America, we're seeing companies like Mercado Libre, which is very similar to Ant in a way because of the start with e-commerce as, as one of the largest e-commerce platforms in, in Latin America. Also look to expand their wallet, uh, Mercado Pago, that's growing uh, extremely quickly. And I think what's, 
What's interesting in their case is it's growing extremely quickly off platform. So a lot of users who are um, paying with their mobile wallet through QR codes in Latin America today using Mercado Pago, and similarly to Ant as well, also building out digital asset management uh, tools and products like, like UAE Bao and um, th their first product, Mercado Fundo, is, is aimed at that, again, locking in users to, to continue to use the mobile wallet. And in Southeast Asia, which was, I'd say, a bit earlier in its development, we're seeing companies like Grab and uh, Gojek's GoPay wallet who are leveraging their ability to access ride hail, uh, the ride hail use case as to differentiate from other mobile wallets in the region, and that's also enabled them to uh, acquire users by using uh, the drivers as offline agents, um, thus funneling them into, the, again, their ecosystem where they're able to drive transaction volumes, and eventually, I would expect, as Indonesia moves and develops uh, and certainly matures, we'll, we'll see other financial products on these wallets as well, like loans and, and wealth management, insurance, et cetera. So just to finish, to wrap up here and, and summarize in the last uh, minute or so, what, where should incumbents prioritize um, because of all this? I think one is to understand, um, you know, track the activity of, of super apps to understand where uh, there's this risk of disintermedi disintermediation. As we see, uh, you know, these marketplaces evolve based on these wallets. I think a lot of banks as well as asset managers, insurance companies will be putting their products on these platforms. If we look at companies like where Tencent and Ant Financial are investing and, and partnering, a lot of activity in Southeast Asia, a lot of activity in, in Latin America and some other parts of the world. Um, but emerging markets is certainly where this is really taking hold today because of a lot of the, the forces at play. And I think another area to think about is also understanding how um, this intermediation also can create uh, customer acquisition and cross-sell opportunities. So as super apps look to seek bank and insurance partners for some of these marketplaces that they're offering, um, I think there will also be opportunities for banks to offer other products to them. We've already seen this take place in some cases, like in Southeast Asia, where banks can leverage that user acquisition from some of the wallets and then bring them into other products uh, and add a lot of new customers through these, uh, through these platforms as well. And I think also concentrating, lastly, on the opportunities based on where these super apps are in that flywheel sort of playbook uh, is really important. If you look at um, an example like Invesco, for example, they've, they've added about $14 billion in assets for their China joint venture just in the last few months, um, viewing it certainly as a major opportunity. And so as we see sort of the wallets uh, develop and, and, and emerge and, and shift their strategy from not just driving transaction and consumption, but as economy like China today where people are now investing into wealth management products, insurance products, protection products. There's opportunities for incumbents to also take advantage of that, add you know, a lot of assets as well as new customers. And I think we're starting to see you know, a lot of incumbents uh, already do that today. So I'm going to wrap up. We're going to turn over to Cameron, who will introduce TOS. Uh, we also have some additional research that we've been putting out on uh, some of these themes and topics. I'd be happy to discuss them with all of you uh, later at the conference as well today. So thank you very much, and look forward to the next talk. That was CB Insights' Matt Wong. You heard from Aria Levy before, and you'll hear from CB Insights' Lindsay Davis after lunch. For the next fireside chat, please help me welcome up our moderator, Dan DeFrancesco from Business Insider. There he is. Thanks so much for, uh, for, for sitting in for our session. I'm joined today by uh, SG Lee, who is the CEO and founder of TOSS. Uh, the popular payment app in uh, South Korea. So TOSS launched in 2015 as a peer-to-peer -peer payments app. Uh, 12 million registered users now. It's raised nearly $200 million to date, valued at $1.2 billion, and it is the first and still the only uh, fintech unicorn in South Korea. So SG, thanks so much for, for taking the time to chat with us today. Uh, to start, can you just give us an intro of... Uh, of TOS, kind of the, the, the business model, and, and kind of just an overview of the company. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, yes, TOS actually started as a P2P uh, payment services, just like a Venmo. But we are so lucky uh, to be in the position that so that we can just fulfill all the voice that was existing in the uh, Korean fintech industry. Uh, well, even despite of like global number 10 GDP and economic states, 
uh, Korea doesn't really have a really proper financial services such as Credit Karma, Mint, or whatsoever. So we are really lucky to have, we're really able to uh, fill all those opportunities there. So right now, TOS is more of uh, Venmo plus Credit Karma plus Mint kind of services. So we, we offer full suits of uh, uh, financial. Uh, so when user I needs of anything related to finance, we just, user can just open up the TOS and they just can solve what they're in needs of. So right now we are uh, 12 million. Uh, most, of, uh, most of them are monthly active and they just access to the app more than 50 times per month. And uh, monthly transaction volume right now is about 3 billion USD. And it is growing at a pace of uh, 10 to 15% every month. So, and right now we are covering 24% of total population that exists in South Korea, and we soon to launch our service in Vietnam market. So, yeah, it's, uh, we're trying to be a, a mobile branch for every financial institution that we made a partnership with so that they can have a really good uh, financial savvy users uh, through the digital channels. Yep. Yeah, as I was going to say, it's not just 12 million registered users, it's 12 million registered users out of 51 million people total in South Korea. That's, sure. Pretty good, pretty good odds. <laughs> um, the, uh, can you talk a little bit, you, you touched on it there, the, uh, the overview of the kind of the Korean, the financial, the kind of fintech market, and how it kind of does compare to the US, because maybe people aren't as familiar. Yes. Actually, uh, the, we have a, a very similar uh, financial dynamics uh, like US rather than China. Uh, the Korean, uh, Korean financial market is quite uh, saturated and it's quite matured. So like, uh, we do, like if you just see the loan market, uh, the Korean loan market is number four in global, and Korea e-commerce market size is number four in global. So if you're just considering the ma land mass and the population of 50 million, it's, it, it doesn't look like really big market, but it's really, uh, it's really saturated and really matured market. And 75% of the population has a, some kind of loans, whether it's a mortgage or unsecured loans. So it's a huge market. And we do have the same FICO system just like in US. So we do have a two credit bureaus dominating the market. So almost the same. But the thing is uh, a, a little bit different because as I already said, none of the financial services such as Credit Karma or Mint or Stripe ever existed before the TOS. So we are the first one who introduced free credit score management, uh, free P2P money transfer, those kind of services for the first time. So, uh, so at, if you see these kind of dynamics in a uh, market situation, uh, it is really hard for you to educate your uh, p uh, customers and users' behavior because most of their behavior is still in the uh, offline. So we are true believers of that we can make a drastic shift in a short period of time from offline habits to the online. Right now, not more than 90% of loan is executed through the offline branch. I think that's crazy <laughs> compared to US especially, but uh, we, we think that that can be online and that can, it's going to unlock a lot of market opportunity right away. And the thing is, and also uh, I just want to highlight that the regulatory easing is very drastic. Uh, a lot of uh, the regulatory bodies are trying to uh, deregulate uh, uh, like innovatively. So uh, it is really good timing for you to, if you're going to start the FinTech business, it's good to be in a South Korea. And, it's, and also it's way better for you to just benchmark all of the great players in global because none of that is, that is existing in Korea. So you can just learn it from the global and just take it and just launch it in Korea. So yeah, that, that kind of things are. A little good. melting pot, right? You get to pick yeah. all the good things from all the other true, countries. True, yeah. it's possible. Yeah, that's <laughs> what we're really aiming for. Sure, so. sure. So as an app, uh, you, you know, you start off with a specific service, right? Peer-to-peer -peer yes. payments, and then you kind of expand um, t in, into kind of other areas, right? I think, what, 25 services now you, you guys? Yeah, 30 services. Yeah. yeah. So, it's a similar kind of trajectory that a lot of U.S. fintechs are making as well, right? Starting in a specific area and then kind of branching out. From your perspective, what was kind of the strategy as you look to expand beyond peer-to-peer -peer payments? Yes, I think uh, there has been a like unbundling versus bundling kind of strategy comparison to one or two years ago, but I think that's not uh, right anymore. I think uh, every, every uh, financial services should collide into one app, like one super app that's going to solve all of the financial needs that users have. 
So it's better for you to have a really high engagement and high frequency usage rather than just, uh, well, if you just see the loans or insurance and all that, it doesn't happen every day, but compared to that, P2P payments or merchant's payments or check, even checking a credit score, that happens more often than uh, just get a loans, right? So, well, Robinhood, uh, the investments happens really uh, uh, often. Like, you, you check your, uh, the market situation like seven times per day. So what I'm saying is, uh, just, it's better in strategic wise, I think it's better just uh, uh, the dominate the use cases of the high frequency uh, and after that you can just add up a, a lot of services that can be useful for the users and if, if you collide all that, then user will going to perceive that app or the services as an as a ultimate app that can solve everything. Like if you, if you just want to check in your balance or money transfer, or you're in need of loans and all that, you can just check there and because you use it every day and you trusted that service for a very long time, it obviously is going to give you a good conversion there. So yeah, I think the uh, becoming only a one app that solves everything is very, makes sense mm -hmm. as time goes by. Uh, because you know, I'm, I'm betting on that the finance institution will going to be not successful about making their digital or mobile presence at all mm -hmm. because, because of their organization issue and all, all those stuff. And as a res but still, uh, operating offline branch is going to cost too much. Mm -hmm. So the, the finance institution will going to face a high CAG problem, like high customer acquisition cost. Mm -hmm. To lowering that, they need a, some really good extension channel or the, the distribution channel that they can utilize in the digital form or the mobile, mm -hmm. and which is really good at uh, from startups or IT com companies. Sure. They, they can provide a lot of great, uh, really financial savvy, uh, great traffic to the finance institutions. And as a result, I think the uh, people will go into the just uh, a non-financial institution app such as Toss or Venmo or Robinhood. And in there, they will going to find that their partner to finance institutions products such as loans and insurance. Mm -hmm. then, so there is a, segre a separation between suppliers and channels mm -hmm. and it's going to be in that way. Uh, is that how you can avoid getting spread too thin as, as you look to expand? So you, uh -huh. you pick that one area, right, where you want to concentrate and you feel like you can really dominate a high frequency area and then as you expand in those other areas, is it with those partnerships with some of the traditional players or, or it, how do you kind of avoid as you kind of expand the business not getting spread out too thin? Sure, I think it's about, uh, yeah, so to, in order to achieve this kind of super app, like for example, we are offering over 30 different product lines across the uh, merchants, in, uh, merchants payments, transactional services, and insurance, and uh, investments, and loans, and all that, uh, which is critical for you to have a really uh, different uh, working principle and team organization. For example, TOS have uh, 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 a 20 different teams consist of eight to 10 person. So they and each and every one is highly aligned, but it also loosely coupled. So they, each and every one decide what the pro product's uh, destiny. Like they, they decide their marketing budget, they decide where this product should go forward. Uh, they don't really report it to me. I mean, oftentimes I was get shocked about the, the speed of innovation that we made in our team because they didn't really share the information the product will going to change in a certain way. But in a sense, uh, by doing so, uh, we can just operate all those uh, 30 over services really rapidly uh, without losing any spark, uh, really a, a great spark, mm -hmm. and still moving fast. And also each and every services has a really good quality. Like, so having this kind of really different, really, uh, uh, rather than hierarchy or top-down kind of uh, teams, uh, having this very autonomy, autonomous team, it's, uh, it's really critical from my point of view. Mm -hmm. So, well, we, we last year, we launched over 100 services and half, more than half of it just killed <laughs> because it wasn't, a, it wasn't loved by the users and it wasn't have any code retention or so. Mm -hmm. So I think the speed of, speed of innovation is one and one of the critical thing for you to do. And in order to keep up that speed, you need to have a really, a really uh, uh, highly coupled, uh, highly aligned, loosely coupled team. Mm -hmm. 
And also, you just, I think you just need to focus on the consumer's problems and needs, sure. rather than making out of something you want. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think that's an pro issue probably a lot of founders might have, right? Yeah. The product they want to launch as opposed yeah. to the product that people want. Um, you, you touched on it earlier, the, um, the, uh, the, the, the decision to go into Vietnam. Can you talk a little bit about those plans? Sure, right. Uh, so, we, uh, so right now, uh, we out of 50 million people in Korea's population, uh, right now we have 24% coverage. But we think the self-tourism points will going to hit at uh, somewhere around 25 million because half of the uh, Korean people are using some kind of mobile banking app or the uh, credit card app, even though it's a cumbersome. Mm -hmm. So I think the 25 million MAU is quite something that we can get with a low, like it's a low hang for, for us. Mm -hmm. But we're trying to keep it up our gross pace so in order to do that, we just want to find out a really good uh, problems and uh, problems that we can solve in global market. And we saw the Vietnam market is really good. So the only thing that we are really laser focus on is just a product market fit. Uh, I think the, uh, the finance is really uh, tricky because there is no ideal one experience that solves everyone's problems. Like if you see the messenger or if you see the Google search, you, there is a just optimal and best experience of search results or the messenger experience. Mm -hmm. But there is nothing there in finance because everyone's financial life is so fragmented. Everyone is different. Like, for example, I only use one credit card. And the most matter to me, choosing that credit card is just design. Mm -hmm. But other guys using four different credit cards because they want mileage and all that benefits that from the credit card company. So everyone's needs are so fragmented and different. So when we go to the global market, such as Vietnam market, we know nothing about that local market. So instead of launching just the, the current product of TOS right away into the Vietnam, we just want to find a really great product hook that we can uh, see the great uh, viral growth. Mm -hmm. So we, we're trying to find a really great product hook or any, uh, uh, any, anything that can show a viral growth uh, with a, uh, in, in the context of a finance. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're just fo focusing on the products and we, we thought it, we, we think we found it one and so we are going to launch in a couple of months. Mm -hmm. Is that, does that come through customer feedback? Does it come from research? Because I think it's an important thing to understand as we're seeing a lot of the, the European digital banks kind of migrate across the Atlantic into the US, they're kind of coming up with similar issues of understanding that the US customer base is very different from True. the European customer base. So w just in general, what advice or what would be the most important thing you, you, it, that when it comes to a fintech that's looking to expand beyond its, its country right. of origin? So a, a lot of uh, global fintech uh, unicorns and companies are trying to launch their own product lines even without changing that much, just, just they launch it in the new area like Australia or the US. But I don't think that strategy will going to work beyond uh, uh, at certain points. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, well, well, I think the Europe and uh, US can, uh, have kind of uh, similar problems and similar needs in the market. So that, that strategy can fit. But uh, I think that at least uh, Asian market is totally different. And if you see the Asian market, Korea is much more like Japan, and China is much more like uh, Southeast Asia. So strategy should be totally different. But just going out there and launching the, the, the status quo products will not going to succeed. So I think the understand the local uh, needs and problems of the finance is critical. And uh, instead of just launching the uh, current app, you should be uh, like making a new app totally, for mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. uh, to solve those uh, local problems. Mm -hmm. I think that's critical. And that's where we're really laser focusing on. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, the becoming, right, reaching unicorn status, does that change the way you operate as a business? I mean, I saw out in the lobby there's a literal unicorn statue um, <laughs> out there that I think people are taking pictures with. As a, a CEO and a founder, when you reach that, there's certainly more attention given to you. Does it change the way you operate as a business at all? Well, personally, I don't, uh, I don't, I don't feel that way because uh, the financial market is so huge. So I think the, the becoming a fintech unicorn doesn't really give you any kind of proof, I guess. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, compared to retail or compared to uh, uh, media market, the financial service market is single most biggest market in any country, and it, it's a well. So I think the uh, becoming a fintech unicorn is kind of uh, you just started, 
mm -hmm. kind of things. And uh, in, in the context of ecosystem, the finance world, uh, people just see the unicorn is not that, I don't know, I mean, well, so personally and also as a company, it doesn't really change. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sure, sure. What about kind of looking ahead now? Just how, do you, how do you see, as a company, how do you see the, the future of the, the fintech market? Yeah, I think the, uh, uh, so as I already mentioned earlier, uh, briefly, uh, I think the, uh, there will be a strong tendency uh, towards uh, separation between product suppliers, such, such as the banks and finance, institution, finance institutions. They will, I, I'm expecting them, well, it's, well, it's a dangerous thing to say, but it's <laughs> going to be much more like factory for them, like OEM factory. Like, they're, like if you do have a same FICO, FICO number, then you will going to get offered the same interest rates from any bank that you are, because your risk profile is exactly the same. So the thing is, except branding, it is getting harder for any finance institution to differentiate themselves from others. Mm -hmm. As a result, it's, it's going to be a much more demand-driven market rather than supply-driven market. And in that case, any, any players, those who have grabbed the last mile of the users, such as TOS or the Credit Karma or Robinhood and all that, Revolut, mm -hmm. they will going to have a, a much stronger power against the finance, financial institution because they became just a factory or the, just a, a loan service provider. Mm -hmm. So I think there will be a separation between channels and uh, the suppliers. And banks and finance, financial institutions still have a chance to become a really dominant distribution channel in the mobile. I think it's a low chance, but it's a, so it's a whole competition. So mm -hmm. I think the, uh, uh, in, in coming three to five years, there will be a strong competi uh, competition between which distribution channel is the dominant player in this market or not. Sure. That's, that, that war will go on. Sure. So, so we're winding down here, and we're going to play a game. I was told it's very popular amongst the crowd, the uh, overrated, underrated. I'm going to share a term or a company <laughs> with you. We're going to put you on the hot seat, and you're okay. going to tell me if it's overrated or underrated. So first one, Amazon. Overrated, Amazon. underrated? I think it's underrated. Okay. Because, you know, Amazon is still very big, and they, I, I heard that they are 40% out of all online transactions in, in, in retail. But still, the mar if you see the uh, industry d uh, dynamics there, the, so I, I see the really uh, interesting statistics uh, before that uh, if you see the advertised market, 80% of revenue is, is coming from online already. So it's a fully, kind of fully online, uh, online-wise. But if you see the retail, only 40% of the market is through the uh, revenue is coming from online. Still, 60% of the revenue come from, I don't know, Costco or Walmart or something. So I think there's a lot of room to grow in terms of offline versus online. Mm -hmm. So I think the, as the Amazon is dominating the online transactions, if the market number of the online 40% uh, out of total retail goes up to 80%, in that case, Amazon can be a way bigger company than sure. status. Next one, blockchain, distributed ledger technology, overrated, uh, underrated? I think it's overrated. Uh, well, I, I see the... Uh, I, I agree, and I see the innovative uh, uh, features in that. Mm -hmm. But well, if there ever be going to be a commercial usable something, it should come out at this time. But right. it doesn't really uh, so far. So I, I don't think it's going to be. Sure. Yeah. Another company you've mentioned a couple of times up here, Credit Karma, overrated, underrated? I, I, in the same sense, it's underrated. Uh, because Credit Karma is already generating tons of tons of revenue and so profitable, uh, and the, the company value is over four billion, but still, I think the, uh, only 32% of the loans are executed through the lo online right now in US. But that number can go up, up to like 70 to 80% in the five or seven year terms. In that case, the Credit Karma's revenue and the impact that has uh, in the society will go dramatically grow up. Mm -hmm. And I love the CEO and founder. I think, I think Ken might be coming up next, so oh, good really? job calling him uh, underrated. Right. Good job. Right. Good call there. And I love you. <laughs> uh, last one, uh, Kakao, which for those that are unfamiliar, it's a very popular messaging app in South Korea. Um, well, I think it's kind of, I must say it's overrated because you know, Kakao has 95% 95, 95 penetration in the market in terms of the messenger, but still, 
they are capable of uh, distributing uh, or engaging users. Is, is, I think it doesn't meet the expectation of the market. So there's a lot of room to grow for Kakao, but current performance is not matching the market. That's my personal view. Sure. Well, SG, thank you very much for taking the time. Thank you. Um, and uh, please, before you give a, give a round of applause to SG and, and stick around for our next session, which is Andy Sewer of uh, Yahoo Finance.